Hello again, Trish Triampho Sullivan. And we are here talking about painting. This is art six, A and B. And this is lecture number 11. We're gonna talk about assignment number three, which is the still life and how to get ready and start painting, okay? So by now you should have done some, um, some practice painting with the, with the, the really the first assignment, which depending on what semester this is, it could be uh, Broken Hearts or Luck or Day of the Dead. Um, we have a variety of different uh, topics, overarching topics for the first assignment. But for this assignment, um, we're gonna be talking about how, just the basic how-tos, okay? So the first thing you're gonna do for a still life, remember this is a still life, And all this means is, is you're painting objects that are holding still, right? So nothing's moving. You're not painting a person or an animal or a bug or anything that might move around. Um, you're painting, uh, or anything outside that could be blowing in the breeze. You're painting objects that are basically holding still for you, right? So just, just objects, things that you have around the house. And the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna arrange your objects. I asked you to get three objects to paint, right? Three objects and you're gonna arrange them. So that's number one. That's the first thing you gotta do is arrange your three objects. I recommend putting them next to a window where you can leave them there for you know a few days to a week while you work on your painting, okay? Um, so you wanna put them next to a window because a window is gonna provide you with, can you guess? Well, if you guessed natural light, you got it. All right, you're gonna get natural light from the window. So if you want natural light, so I want you to have the light coming from the side of the objects so that you'll see light and shadow, right? When we're talking about light logic, we're talking about what direction is the light coming from and what's your point of view. So your point of view is looking at the objects with light coming from the side, right? And shadow on the other side. So that's what we wanna see, some light and shadow. Um, so once you have your objects arranged how you think, and I recommend you try to choose um, objects of varying heights, so not you don't just have three things in a row. You've got some, some uh, maybe even a kind of triangular composition. That's always a really good way to start. That's a classic composition. So the basic shapes kind of form a triangle. Um, it's very pleasing to the eye. Um, and then, so the second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna do a couple of rough sketches. And when I say a rough sketch, what I mean is a really rough sketch. This is not a finished drawing. You're just gonna do um, a couple of rough sketches. And to do that, you can take your, your large drawing pad, right? Um, or even your small one. And you know, I like to go in order. So I tend to go in the order of, of my drawings. And um, that way I'm kind of keeping it linear date wise. I can see my progress throughout the the semester, right? Um, so you're gonna take your, your pencil, right? And you're going to, and I'm pretending I'm, I'm actually looking at my, at my subject right now. Let me grab my pencil here. Um, and I'm gonna just do a rough sketch of my subject really quick, because I'm actually looking at my stuff there just to see if this might be the, the actual way that I want um, my composition to pan out. Um, so I have, you can see my, what I'm doing. When I say a rough sketch, I'm not trying to make it look exactly of what I'm doing, but I do want to have an idea of not only where my subjects are placed, but how, um, how the composition looks. So if I just do this rough sketch 
and I'll show you my composition here in just a minute, you're gonna see that I'm not really like sketching anything um, that looks like a finished product, right? I'm just doing a sketch just to kind of see if that composition works for me. So this is a very rough sketch. You can see here that I've just done a really rough sketch of my composition. And I've arranged it a couple times to see how I like it. And now I've found that I that I like this one best. So I kind of did a rough sketch. And as I'm looking at it, I, I'm thinking, well, maybe I want to change a thing or two. So I might move it around just a little bit. Um, and I might do it. And, I, and if I move it around, I'll do another sketch, a rough sketch, okay? Once I've done that, once I've got my, my arrangement done, then I'm going to use my picture plane. And I'm going to choose a... Uh, viewfinder right and remember when you do this you're gonna hold up your picture plane you're gonna close one eye right and you're going to um, remember you have to keep still you have to be uh, you have to have your point of view kept the same so you don't move your head from side to side or up and down right you stay still and then you're going to using your I don't have it with me here but using your dry erase marker you're going to draw the entire composition right on your uh, picture plane and you can move it forward or backward to decide like size and placement you know and you can decide which size of your uh, viewfinder is going to work best for you right you might want one that that's smaller has a smaller opening in it um, for this particular one okay so you're going to choose that then you're going to um, do an actual drawing, right? So you're going to do, you're going to start off with your, uh, by taking your uh, viewfinder and tracing the inside of it, right? Then you're going to, uh, with the side of your pencil, kind of scribble, you know, uh, get the graphite on there, cover that whole surface. Then you're going to tone it. Remember, toning your paper is you take a Kleenex or a very soft napkin and you rub it in circles, right? And you press hard. So you really got to press on there to get to rub that in. Then your paper is toned. And then you're going to do um, you're going to do a drawing, right? So you're going to do a, a an actual um, fully realized drawing of your subjects okay um, then from there once you've got your 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 drawing done um, so let's write that down so you're going to do rough sketches and then you're going to do a fully realized drawing which means you put all the detail in And I'm gonna tell you right now, you guys, I really re highly recommend, and I highly recommend this, um, that you paint subjects that you enjoy, right? Don't just grab some crap that you don't care about, um, but paint something that you like enough that you might wanna actually hang it on your wall, or um, and so that you enjoy the actual painting process because it's something that you enjoy looking at, right? Um, or if maybe maybe you're making this painting because you'd like to give it as a gift, right? Mother's Day is coming up. You could give a hand painted still life to your to your mom, right? Um, so that would be a, a good a very good reason to paint something that that looks good. So don't just like grab any crap. Get something cool that you think will look good and that you will enjoy painting, right? So you're going to do your fully realized drawing. The third step is you're going to prepare your canvas. And I'm putting the canvas in quotes because if it's watercolor paper, you're going to stretch your paper on a board, okay? If it is a, a, a canvas or a cardboard, you're going to gesso it. So you're going to make sure that your, that your paper or your canvas is prepared. And I say canvas, but we're talking about the ground, right? You're going to prepare your ground. Your ground is what you paint on. And, but it's mostly called can a canvas. You hear people say canvas even when they're talking about watercolor paper, okay? Um, 
And then once you've done that, you're going to do what we call mapping. You're gonna map out your composition. have room to write composition there. Um, so let's, let me erase this and we're gonna go, we're, we're gonna put that number four up on the top here for you so that you see what I'm talking about. So I'll do a little, little drawing of it too. So you're going to map your composition and what that means is let's say this is my still life okay and I want oh you know and I want you to remember that your composition your orientation of your composition depends on um, it, it highly depends on which how your how your uh, your objects your still life are set up so if I have things that are more spread out I'll use this type of a format, this orientation, which is horizontal or landscape, right? If my stuff is kind of taller, I'll use this orientation, right? Or a vertical orientation or portrait, right? So you look at your composition, you decide what format fits it. All format means is the size and shape of your ground that you're painting on. So when you say format, we're talking about size and shape and then also orientation, right? So does it go this way? Does it go this way? That makes sense? So in other words, if you have something really tall and you're painting it, it's only gonna take up about this much of your paper if, you're, if you have this orientation, right? Or this much of your canvas. It's just gonna be a little thing in the middle because you're going top to bottom here, right? Um, if you have something wide, that's where you're gonna use this orientation. If it's tall, you're gonna use this orientation. Okay, that's what you want. Um, so you definitely want to do that. So you're going to map out your composition. And what that means is you're going to, you're going to put in your crosshairs, right? You're going to use your pencil to lightly put in your crosshairs so that you have that, well, if I can draw a line across there, I'll be, I'll be in better shape, won't I? There we go. Um, so you're going to put your crosshairs in like you have on your viewfinder and on your drawing. When you do your drawing, you use your crosshairs to help, to help with the proportion and the placement and orientation. Um, and then you're going to map out your, your canvas and, and or your composition. And what that means is, is you're going to very lightly with your pencil, you're going to put some of the basic shapes and where they're at on your canvas. So in this case, you know, if I have, I have um, kind of a shape here, very lightly, I'm gonna kind of put that in and I'm gonna put this in so I know where it's at on the composition. So I have this kind of basic shapes. It's just an over, it's a map, okay? So you're not doing, and then the next thing that you do once you've mapped it um, is you're gonna mask it. So you have this map where you have very lightly put in some of the basic shapes you are not going to redraw your entire composition, okay? You're not, you just did a drawing. You're not drawing it again on your, on your canvas, okay? I want you to just draw some basic suggestions of shapes and placement so that you have just enough idea of where things are at in your composition, where they're gonna be, right, and their shape. So that you know where they're at but you're not drawing you're not going to draw it and it's, it has to be very light and then next you're going to mask you're going to mask the areas that you need to keep white All right and that's usually where light is hitting your subject All right so you're going to mask areas of light um, and that's anywhere that the light, anywhere that the light hits your subject. And so you have your different tools that you can use for masking. You've got rubber cement, right? You've got, um, uh, lick, uh, a crayon, like a white crayon that you can use to mask. Um, and you've got painter's tape. 
So you have those three uh, tools to use to mask off the areas that you need to keep white. So you'll need to make sure that you have, um, so if I'm looking at my subject, let me do a different color. So we'll pretend this blue is my painter's tape. So I can cut or tear pieces so that I can make sure that I know I need to have some white left there. So I'm gonna, maybe I'll put some painter's tape there. Um, I see that there's definitely some space here that's gonna need some painter's tape. And if I were doing this on my paper right now, I would be cutting out the tape, right? Um, I see that there's definitely three places there. Some of this will be, would be better suited for, um, uh, for using a crayon with, right, or a rubber cement. So I see that I have these places I'm gonna definitely need to have mapped out uh, or masked out um, with, with some tape, right? And I see that there's definitely some here. I'll need some tape like there and probably there too, right? So I see, I see exactly where I need that. Um, and then over here, I'm looking and I see that I've got some places here that will need uh, masking. Um, I've got a place there and a place there and even a couple down here. So as I'm looking, I'm looking at my composition right now and I'm saying, here's where I need to put some tape or some rubber cement or color it with some crayon so that I can mask those places and it they won't I won't have any um, and I won't have any paint going in those places right so you have to think of it a lot in kind of a positive negative way so you know the positive spaces would be where the lights hitting and the negative would be the dark and sometimes it helps you know if you take if you wear glasses take your glasses off or if you don't squint your eyes and when you squint your eyes it's a lot of times those those lights will pop out at you. If you're not seeing them, do a good squint, you know, squint your eyes up and see, and those lights will just pop right out. And you'll be like, oh, now I know where I need to mask. Um, so you're gonna wanna mask in advance, make sure you keep those areas white. Remember you guys, this is for watercolor. So right now I'm just talking watercolor on how to prepare and get ready to go. Um, and so you're going to mask your areas and remember that the types of masking, you can have rubber cement. You can have a crayon, a white crayon. Or you can use painter's tape. or a combination of all three. Um, I find that geometric shapes are often easier when you're using painter's tape. You can cut, cut out shapes um, a lot easier on that. Whereas um, more organic shapes um, work better with rubber cement and crayons, okay? Um, and the crayon, the crayon you don't take off. You don't have to take it off because it just, it just resists the, uh, the paint. So it just stays on there. It's white just like your paper, so it's fine. All right, so now we've got number six, which is you're gonna begin your painting. to begin painting and what you're going to do is um, you're going to be using you're going to be using shapes of color light and shadow right So in painting, we're not drawing lines like we do when we're drawing. We're painting with a brush and we're basically painting these different shapes of color. And I know it's a little bit hard to, to make that switch, 
um, but you're not going to be having any any problems with it when you get the concept that we're painting shapes of color right that's it so you're, you're going to begin mixing and trying out colors to try and get the closest color to the the subject right so you're going to do it as close as you can get to this the actual color of the subject and to do that I want you to take a piece of paper, like from the edge of your, uh, of whenever you cut a piece of paper off, like to make the size of the, of the paper that you need for this particular subject, um, you're gonna save it. You're gonna save these little end pieces. Not only do they make good miniatures, right? You can make a little miniature painting by cutting it into a, a smaller shape, um, but they make great trial test, uh, test areas. So when you're trying to get a color to match, you can make little marks on your paper and see if that's the color you want before you put it on your painting. It sucks when you when you <clears throat> go put color on your painting, you're like, oh my God, that looks like crap. So you want to try it out beforehand. And so having a little, a little uh, edge piece of your watercolor paper, and it needs to be your watercolor paper. You can't just use random paper because it won't show up the same. Um, you can use it to make little marks on there and see if the color is right for your particular thing. Um, so you're going to save these and use these. <clears throat> so that's your, like your test. So you're going to be testing, mixing and testing colors. And a really good, I'm going to just say, a really good exercise, you guys, um, is to mix some colors just randomly and have some fun with it. Try them out. And then, and then even you can even make a little um, trial sheet where you make some little squares of of the color and write down what you mixed. You know, this is this is red and green and show how it looks. This is red and purple and show how it looks, so that you have an idea of what they look like, and then it can help you save time when you're mixing. Um, so it's just it's not required for this class, but you might find it very helpful. Okay. So you're going to be mixing colors and testing them, right? You're going to test on your, on your little test sheet. All right, so that's, um, so you want to make sure you do that. And then I want you just to remember once again, I'm going to repeat it once again, that, um, that, that, Painting is not about lines, it's about shapes. So shapes of color, light, and shadow. So super important that you get that. Um, so now you're going to paint, right? You're just gonna start painting. Um, and, uh, and I want you to remind you that you have to let the paint dry in between different steps or different parts of your painting. Um, especially if you're layering, but even if you're not layering, if you have a color that's close to another color and this one's wet and you try to put the other color right next to it, it's gonna bleed in and you may not want that. Um, so I really highly recommend that you let the painting dry in between steps, just like we did with our, with our test, right? As so we did with this, right? We let it dry in between each of the steps that we did. So when we did the layering, we know we did these and then we let it dry for like half hour to an hour, okay? Um, and that's why I highly recommend that it, and it, will, it will greatly help you, right? If you were working on several paintings at once, which is why you're gonna, you're gonna be working ahead. In other words, you're not just gonna work on the still life, but you might work on your your first painting and then the painting that comes after this one as well, right? So you might work on, on more than one. I recommend you work on at least, at least two paintings at once so that you can go back and forth. Um, three is even better. So you really want to have that, um, that freedom to to be able to let the painting, the paint dry in between. That's incredibly important, okay? So you're gonna work on at least two paintings at once. Three is better, but you know, you do what you can. Um, 
And because, you know, lots of painting, you guys, is just, and this is true for oil painting too, is it's a lot of hurry up and wait, right? You, you're hurrying up and waiting for the, <laughs> the paint to dry, basically. And so you're twiddling your thumbs, waiting for the paint to dry, and being like, when is it ever going to dry? Mm. Okay, not a good thing. Um, and so finally, I want you to utilize the techniques um, that we learned uh, during when we did this demo. So that means the different types um, the different types of texturing, of layering. And this is true for the oil people too. Almost every single thing that we did on this paper, okay, every single thing that we did on here works with oils too. The only thing that won't really do is the salt. Um, but sponging, dry brushing, um, doing the, the, uh, the brush rolling, uh, resist stuff, all this stuff works with, um, with oil paints just as well as it does uh, with the other. Now I'm gonna show you really quick um, my composition that I just did, I just put together, and I'm just gonna move my, my uh, phone here, and we'll go over to the area. So notice I have a window here, and next to the window, I've put up my composition. And you can do some different things um, with your composition, but let me get in close here so you can kind of see what I'm doing. So I put together some things I liked, right? I have a plant, you can use a flower if you'd like. I've got a, a cool bottle. It could be full or empty, this one happens to be empty, but I like the shape of it and I think it looks good. Now I've got kind of a round, you know, uh, cylindrical shape with the planter. I've got an organic shape with the plant and the leaves. Then I've got this kind of interesting glass bottle. And then down here, I have a camera. And um, these are things I like, right? I like the shape of the bottle, I like my camera, and I like the plant. And so I've made this arrangement, and, and you'll notice it's next to a window. So we've got light coming from over here. and hitting the side of the camera and the side of the planter. And on the other side, there's shadow. So we have shadow there and light there. Um, and you can see the reflection of the light from the window on the glass bottle and on the camera and on the planter and even the leaves. And this is what helps give a three-dimensional feeling to a two-dimensional work is by the light and the shadow that we get when we're when we're doing this from light. So you see it's not in the window, it's next to the window so that the light is coming from the side. And when I paint this, that's what it's going to show. Okay? So we'll see you next lecture.